we, I think, procured like an unbelievable panel uh, today. And uh, I uh, want to introduce you to the session leader, uh, which is Kristen Bauarthur, uh, with a long extinguished career in distribution first, and now uh, one of the managing directors or managing partners, one of them, I've always mixed these things up, but a really important person at First Beverage, which is uh, an investment fund uh, based on the West Coast in the United States uh, with a lot of uh, uh, investments in a lot of fast-moving consumer goods and very successful on the beer side and on the spirit side. Here's Kristen. Thanks. I'm glad to see Harry just gave me a promotion to managing partner, which is always good news. I'll call Bill right now. <laughs> That's right, and there were witnesses. Um, no, I feel very honored to actually have the opportunity to be here with friends and colleagues um, in the spirit space and some very interesting people, both from an entrepreneur standpoint as well as an investment standpoint. Um, we'd really love to have a very open discussion kind of about how to finance your entrepreneurial spirits venture. Um, and just to sort of lay out the format for everybody so we're kind of clear, it is an open dialogue. I'm going to be asking questions and then I think at the end we'll leave enough time for Q&A. Um, for any questions any, anybody has, it's out there. Um, but separately, I think Harry gave a very nice introduction for me. Thank you very much. Um, we're a firm that's completely dedicated to beverages. Um, we're a private equity investor that makes minority investments in founders and in brands to really help them grow their brands over roughly a five to seven year period. Um, so just at a high level, that's me. But I've actually asked each of the panelists to give a little bit of a description of themselves too, such that we all have a picture of both the background they have from an investment side as well as from an entrepreneur side too. So Kristen, I was hoping you were gonna give me a, a promotion too and introduce me with a higher title than I have. But um, my name is Nick Papanicolaou and I'm a VP of business development for Pernod Ricard for a group we have called New Brand Ventures which is a bit of a hybrid between a internal incubation group. So we've taken some of our own brands that we think had potential, but had never really been given the, the, the love and resources and attention to scale. So a hybrid between internal incubating those brands and then some venture investing type of activity, whether it's minority investments or majority investments into small emerging brands. Uh, before I joined Pernod Ricard, I'd actually launched my own spirits product as well. Um, so hopefully if there's a unique perspective I can provide, it's, it's a little bit of seeing both ends of the spectrum. So very early stage um, uh, brands and, 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 and how they raise money to now the other end of the spectrum with strategics partnering with some of those brands as well. Hi, I'm Frank Lampen, one of the co-founders of Distill Ventures. Uh, so we, we are an independent accelerator for spirits brands. We do have this partnership with Diageo, um, and that came about because um, when my business partner and I wanted to create something to provide the sort of ecosystem that I think exists in a lot of sectors in, in the economy now, but not really in drinks, when we wanted to do that, um, we didn't want to uh, uh, fail to provide one of the most pressing needs, which is access to cash. And particularly, I think, if you're interested in doing things in whiskey, because we really love kind of whiskey, you, you realize that it's kind of very expensive business to be in. So, so for us, we needed an investment partner um, with uh, access to sort of tens of millions of dollars of funding so we could kind of make really sizable investments in, in companies. And so we approached Diageo, and, uh, and they said they were interested in being a partner. Our model's a little bit different, I think, than, than what Nick does in that um, our model it's all about uh, put a minority investment into companies, uh, really where we believe in the team and the idea and the proposition they've got. And then it's about uh, giving that team access to cash, some support if they need it, some assistance in uh, managing the, the route to market, particularly in markets like the US if they need it, but really allow them as, a, as an independent business, an independent team to, to grow and scale their business to a point where it might be at some kind of meaningful scale. Uh, so that's what we do. We've been doing it for about five years, about... Uh, 17 or 18 companies in the portfolio now across the world, uh, big focus in Europe, a couple of investments in Australia and uh, the last years in the US um, where we've built a, a really nice portfolio in the last three years. Hello, how are you? Uh, I'm Tom Mooney. I'm founder and CEO of Westward, uh, an American single malt whiskey. Uh, I have been in the beverage industry for 15 years. Uh, first at Fiji Water, uh, which I guess we won't talk about as much today. Uh, later as one of the owners of House Spirits Distillery, uh, which was one of the pioneers of craft distilling in the U.S. Not the pioneer, I'm not picking a fight with you. One of. Uh, and uh, 
And so through my involvement with House Spirits, I had the opportunity to uh, develop a number of brands, uh, Aviation Gin, uh, which we sold a couple of years ago, uh, and again, most recently, Westward, uh, which is one of the leaders uh, in American single malt whiskey. Uh, and I think on this panel, I represent uh, the capital seekers as opposed to the investors, so uh, happy to share my experience. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I said good afternoon. Come on. All together now. Thank you. I said yesterday, this isn't a funeral. We're at a bar show. You maybe didn't have enough to drink. My name's John McDonald. I'm 35 years in the business. Uh, this is the best industry to be in. I started with Joseph E. Seagram and Sons. These two gentlemen might remember that company before they ripped it apart. We sold great <laughs> brands like Jameson, Captain Morgan, uh, Crown Royal, et cetera, et cetera. Seagram was the biggest, baddest liquor company in the world. And then we put you, Pernod Ricard, on the map. You're, you weren't even called Diageo. You were Grand Med IDV, I don't even know. Anyway, I'm the old guy. After Seagram, do you know what the stupid grandson theory is? Right, the grandfather started Seagram Liquor Company. He hands it over to the father. The father makes it into this behemoth liquor company. Really, number one in the world. He hands it over to the grandson who destroys it. Very quickly, too, I might add. So after that experience, I started my own company, sales and marketing, and then I started my first entrepreneurial adventure with Patron Tequila Company, and we were fortunate enough to catch these guys sleeping, and we exploded ultra premium tequila, true story. And then now I am arguably with the best brand potentially in the history of the liquor company, Tito's Handmade Vodka. I also invest in a lot of brands personally and advise, so hopefully I can give you, um, save you a lot of trouble is what I'd like to say. Thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> well, so just to give a high-level recap to a few things we're going to go through. One is just forecasting financial need of a new-to-market brand. The second is really what are the financing options available to you, um, and which is part of the reason, too. I know John is an angel investor, has a really unique perspective, along with some of the other people <coughs> on this panel, in terms of what options are. Um, we're going to talk about how an investor will think about the opportunity, and then recipes for success or common pitfalls that we've seen out there. So I think the first one, just to, to tee up the question, you know, when creating a new-to-market breakout brand, what does the journey look like and how much capital is typically needed? Um, I put up sort of two examples up here just because I think it's interesting and it's typically the type of uh, companies that we see in investor decks that somebody's saying to us, hey, I'm going to be the next Tito's, I'm going to be the next Casa Amigos. I'm not sure all of us are Tito or George Clooney, which is of question. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but I did find it interesting if you just think from a timing perspective, you know, Tito's, it took him 10 years to get to 100,000 cases. Um, and he actually today is still an independent player. So he really self-funded most of that um, and found a way to make that happen without actually raising money, which is a very unusual situation I think that we see today in an unusual success. Um, the other one would be something like a Casa Amigos, four years to 100,000. Um, and obviously they recently uh, transacted as well, but just a very different picture on timing. Um, but as we think of as an entrepreneur, thinking about how far out do you have to be thinking about your capital needs, I thought that'd be a worthwhile conversation for us to just sort of start at. Um, and to that note, I mean, Tom, I, I know you had a very interesting experience in terms of launching House Spirits and have moved sort of your thinking over the past few years as far as what you did with your individual brands. It'd be good to get a sense from you as to how, how you think about that. I think it's, I mean, it's extraordinarily important to, to begin with two kind of fundamentals. One is a very clear vision of where you want to go and you know what you want to accomplish, what you want to create, what you want to build, uh, but also you know an equally honest acceptance of the fact that you don't know how you're going to get there, uh, and you know you have to have a plan because it's worse if you don't have one. Uh, but you also have to remember that you know, your plan is based on what you know at that moment, and what you know at that moment will change every day and every week. 
And, and so the, the journey is, is unpredictable, I would say. And, and so even if the destination is clear, um, you know, it, in terms of thinking, bringing it back to capital needs, I think it's, it's important to, to go into it you know, with a bit of the logic of anybody who's ever remodeled a house or apartment. Uh, it's going to take at least twice as long and cost twice as much as your worst, you know, possible estimate. Uh, and then still things are going to happen along the way. So uh, I, I would say, you know, in creating Aviation Gin and seeing it all the way through, you know, when we sold it, which was over a decade, um, we, you know, we were able to create the brand uh, really with very modest financing and, you know, getting it up the ground on, you know, credit card debt and home equity loans and things like that. But, you know, we soon realized that, that it was going to take more than that to build, you know, the kind of global brand we wanted it to be. Uh, and so now in hindsight, hilariously, we decided that what we really needed was to raise $4 million and that with that we were going to build, you know, a great global gin brand. Uh, about 12 months later, we called our investors and said we were wrong. And, you know, we were really apologetic and you know, it's going to take more money. Uh, and to their credit, they all laughed and said, if you thought you were going to get there with what you initially raised, you're the only person among us who thought that. Uh, so we always knew this call was coming. Um, but I, I think it, that reflects, you know, what that journey is for most people I know, uh, which is you just don't know the twists and turns that will come along the way. Uh, and even if you could predict it, you don't know how the environment you operate in will change. Uh, and so for us in particular, you know, having, we, we were one of the first you know, 20 or 25 craft distilleries in the United States. Uh, aviation was one of the first craft gins in the United States. We, our whole big bet on why this was going to be doable, you know, with relatively modest investment was, you know, we're doing something people will get really excited about. Uh, what we underestimated was that they would get so excited that there would be 2,000 craft distilleries and about 10,000 gin brands. Uh, and it turned out that that was a more expensive thing to, to go out and do. So, so I guess in a nutshell, I would say, you know, you've got to have a plan. You've got to have, try to fund it at least, you know, two to three years out so that you don't spend your whole life raising money like I did. Uh, and, uh, but then just be ready to be wrong because you will be an awful lot of the time and that's okay. Yeah, and I guess to that, to that question though about how much money is needed, I mean, do we think there's any rule of thumb in terms of what's required if you're, you know, an, a brand that does not require aging versus one that does or a brand that's in Europe versus a brand that's in the U.S.? Um, it'd be helpful to have some perspective just from each of you. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't believe... So I guess I don't have enough experience because my only experience is what I did to come up with a rule of thumb, but I bet I'm sitting amongst people who do have that. So I will hand it over to them in a moment. Uh, I mean, I can, I can tell you that you know, our personal experience, and, and again, in sharing what I'm allowed to share, uh, I mean, that $4 million investment to build aviation really turned into more than a $20 million investment. Um, Certainly people have done big things with a lot less, and I've also seen a lot of people do nothing with a lot more. Um, so, you know, that was, that was our experience. Um, I will let my esteemed fellow panelists tell you if that's normal or if we were really bad at what we were doing. Yeah, Frank, do you have a perspective on that? Uh, it really varies. Uh, it varies, you know, where, what category you're in and what country you're in, really. Whiskey is expensive. If you want to build any kind of sizable whiskey business, and not take you know, several generations to do it, you're going to need tens of millions of pounds or dollars uh, because you just really need to get ahead of the curve in terms of laying down stock because otherwise you're going to build some momentum and not have any stock to kind of fulfill that. And I think the cycle is kind of going faster and faster and you, just got, you risk other people moving in and sort of kind of taking that space on the shelf. So, so whiskey, you are talking about multiples of, of tens of millions of pounds or dollars. Uh, other categories, it's different. I mean, I, th I think, you know, in white spirits, you, you can see brands which are kind of scaling fast with the type of investment Tom's talking about. There are, there are some opportunities. I think we've seen, if any, in the last panel, there are some opportunities in terms of uh, what super premium gin has been doing in Europe, where people have built very big, very profitable businesses on a few hundred thousand pounds and, and a bit of debt uh, to, to fund some cash flow. So it, it, it varies enormously within that. 
Great. And just moving on to, I think, and, and we've started talking about this a little bit, but what factors should one uh, consider that impact the financial need? And I guess maybe, Nick, do you have any viewpoints on that, too? Sure. Um, everything. <laughs> no, I think, I think um, you know, to, to piggyback a bit off what Frank said, I think a lot depends on, on the business model and what type of spirit you are. So, um, you know, are you a, 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 a premium, super premium vodka at uh, $45 versus, a, you know, an eight-year-old whiskey at $25? I mean, clearly that's going to have a big impact on your margins, your profitability, and therefore your cash flow. Um, again, if you're laying down liquid rum or whiskey, you need to think about the cash flow reinvestment that's going to need to go to either purchasing source liquid or, or laying it down yourself and that money not paying off for several years later. So I think those are all factors that, that we would look at. I think another uh, kind of the way New Brand Ventures looks to, to grow brands, and this isn't always the case, but we look at a very kind of hyper-local, geo-focused approach, uh, geo-targeted approach. And uh, to us, that does not mean rolling out, you know, 10 markets all at once. So I think if, the, if that's part of your plan, which it very well could be, um, but it's, it's typically not what we do in your new brand ventures, I think that would uh, certainly impact the money you're going to need up front to open up each new market. So to follow up on your points, I would first look at it. Let's assume we're talking about the U.S. first and white spirits, you know, the challenges for all new brands that start in the U.S., the big mistake they made if you're not with these two gentlemen is that you're going to sell to the distributor and the distributor is going to take your brand to the promised land. Well, that's not going to happen. What, how successful your brand is in the United States is dependent on you. You need your own people. You need a ton of money to incentivize the distributor. You need to come up with creative ways to get on the shelf in the retail shop. And one of the most important points I would make when thinking about how much money you need to raise, are you going to build your brand in bars and restaurants or are you going to build your brand in the store? So the store requires much less capital. Tito's was built off premise. A lot of other brands today go through the on-premise model, bars and restaurants. So just think about how much money it costs to give an account um, 50 copper mugs, as an example, and then multiply that by 500. I mean, you're already eating into the first two million that he raised. So whatever you raise, to your point, raise triple, right out of the box, because he probably spent half his time raising money instead of focusing on the business. If you're in Europe, there's a different set of challenges. And, that, and I, I worked in Europe and Asia, so I can speak to this point. In the US, you sell supplier to a distributor to the retailer. When you deal in Europe and Asia, supplier to the distributor, to the sub-wholesaler, to the retailer. And maybe the sub-wholesaler sells it to another sub-wholesaler, because nobody wants to take the credit risk. You know, collecting money is a whole nother conversation. So in Europe, it's going to cost you a small fortune because I keep referring to Pernod and Diageo. They have the muscle to buy out outlets. So they can walk in and write checks. And if you're a single brand owner, you can't compete like that. So you've got to focus on secondary cities instead of the main cities. So <clears throat> bottom line is, here's my quick story. A guy calls me up three months ago. He says, I've got to talk to you, and I'm telling you this is a true story. He says, I've got a great proposition for you. I walk into the Marriott lobby in Boston. He puts the product down on the desk. He goes, this is going to make us a fortune. I looked at it. It looked like urine in a bottle. I couldn't pronounce the, <laughs> what the name was, and I never heard of the category. I said to the guy, how much money are these people willing to invest? He said, $3 million. I said, great, this is going to be a very short meeting. He goes, why is that? I go, because this is what we're going to do. Tell the founder, put a million dollars in his pocket, and give each of us a million dollars, because this thing's a losing proposition. So the bottom line is, it's going to be a lot harder than you ever think. It's just the deck is stacked against you today. And I'll, I'll just add quickly, too. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think uh, one thing I didn't mention that John touched on is, is what strategy you're going after. So, you know, not just the channel on and off, but even within the on, are you a very kind of slow, organic, grassroots, bartender to bartender story where you're, you know, pitching your one cocktail? Are you, 
you know, a shot that's capitalizing on a trending flavor that can explode much more quickly, or you, you know, in bed with a celebrity that can amplify it much more quickly. So all, all these things, I think, will certainly play a role in how much money you need to, uh, to put into the brand. And also, on a separate note, I wanted to say that we were told as a finance group that it might not be the most exciting panel, and to spice it up, I think we figured out John's going to be the one to do that. I like, I like I just started. <laughs> I love the controversy. I do have to say, though, to this point, I, one of the things I find very interesting when you talk to people with new brands is really the thoughtfulness that goes behind the competitive set. And a little bit, John, to that point about the brand, you know, I think you really do have to think about what else is out there in the competitive set. What are the large players doing in the space? How is that going to impact your strategy? And what does it mean in terms of what capital you're really going to need? Um, and I, I love the comment from the last panel that had to do with somebody seeing their distributor as being like FedEx. Um, bad, bad FedEx. Bad FedEx. Yeah. Not even good FedEx, bad. just bad FedEx. Um, but I do think from a capital need, people tend to focus a lot on the distillery um, and not always take the time to think through, wow, I didn't realize I'm really going to have to have a person in every single state where I want to operate in the U.S., um, and I can't say that as much for Europe, but I do think that that's something really kind of as a watch out a little bit. Um, except for somebody like my friend here who uh, somehow covers the entire U.S. plus how many markets? 30? 25? 30? 35? <laughs> With four people. So um, <laughs> there are exceptions. Um, but nonetheless, something to consider. So just moving on, um, as far as types of needs for uh, new to market brands that, that allow them to be successful, you know, what are the types of resources needed, how do needs evolve, and what are common pitfalls? Um, and I do think, to this note, um, I do think one of the things uh, that would be worth talking about is, you know, where have we seen brands actually spend a lot of money out the gate but not necessarily have the ROI? Um, and I don't know, Tom, I don't know if you want to start with that a little bit, because I know that you launching a brand probably have a different perspective. Were there things that you spent money on that you, in retrospect, said, boy, I wish I didn't go that route? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it happens to everybody. Uh, I, I mean, I'll, I'll make a general comment about it and then share a few examples. But I, I think anybody, you know, in the early stages of building a brand, needs to think not in terms of getting it all right, uh, because you can't, uh, but in terms of failing small so that when you try things and they don't work, you know, it's not devastating, it's just part of the learning process. Uh, and so I'll, I'll begin with an example that didn't happen to us, but I've seen it happen to a number of people. Uh, and it's not because we're not dumb enough to have done this, we just didn't actually do this. Uh, but I mean, I've met people who spent, let's say, went out and raised a million dollars uh, and spent it all on market research and package and brand design. And so there are a million dollars into it without ever selling the first bottle of something. Um, and I would say, I mean, I'll, I'll make plenty of fun of myself on this panel, but one thing that I think we've historically done right, to answer your question in the opposite way, the positive, um, is, is to really get you know, products in the hands of consumers in the most efficient way possible uh, so that very early on we can get the feedback that matters the most, uh, which is, do you like it? You know, is there something in this bottle that is worth spending money on, making it prettier, making it more available, but fundamentally, you know, have we created something that's different enough to be interesting, uh, but also good enough that, you know, it's not a one-off, but you want to keep, you know, enjoying this. Uh, and so I think finding ways to inexpensively do that uh, is is really crucial. Uh, I would say, you know, to look at it on on the opposite end, you know, what, what have we spent a lot of money on that even hurts to think about and didn't have the ROI uh, is probably more on the commercial side. So uh, early on, you know, our game plan was, you know, we're going to go out and build a big sales team, uh, and we started, you know, kind of doing our math to John's point, you know, the Bad FedEx isn't going to go out and build the demand, so we, we need to build a sales team to do it. And we figured that, you know, we really couldn't move the needle without a sales team of at least 15 to 20 people. Uh, and, and I think that was probably a reasonable assessment. What was unreasonable was not going through the thought process that a company our size can't actually afford that. 
uh, and to hire the kind of people who really move the needle in sufficient numbers to do it uh, was ended up being, I mean, the first year of us building a sales team, we built it up to 15 people uh, who collectively represented 130% of our revenue in terms of payroll cost. And so, I mean, we explained it. I know, you can laugh, it's okay. <laughs> it still hurts a little bit, but you know, we'll get You're through this. It. Uh, and so, you know, we, we real, I mean, the, obviously the thesis was we're going to spend 130% of revenue this year, but revenue will take off. Uh, and it just didn't in a sufficiently fast way to make up for that kind of investment. So we, you know, about a year and a half into that, I, I got to fly to every place where we had hired someone and have a really bad meeting with them about how we were dismantling the team and thank them for their help and, you know, help them find their next job. And it sucked. Uh, we spent a lot of money and, you know, had a very bad time dismantling what we had worked pretty hard to build. And we should have never done it. You know, we should have just realized there are certain things that you need that are of a certain size that you can't afford, and that's when you go out and find a partner to do this, not, not try to build it on your own. So, no, I hope that's sufficiently heartfelt. <laughs> it is. I think the other thing I've seen people, though, do, which I'm just going to cite, too, is if you focus on a few markets and not the entire U.S., you know, your, your burn just is significantly less. So we've seen some people, particularly uh, our investment that we have in a whiskey distillery out of Colorado, he spent a lot of time self-distributing uh, self his product and selling his product in that state and did it pretty damn inexpensively um, and really got some of that feedback in a positive way that I think that, um, that you all have mentioned, such that you can sort of adjust your plan, move forward, realize what you really do need when you want to go into two, three, four markets. Um, but the concept that you go out the gate full blown and just see how it goes has always been a, a little bit of a challenging one. Um, yeah, and I mean, just to yeah. illustrate that point, I mean, when, when we sold aviation two years ago and recommitted to something that, you know, behind the scenes we'd already committed two years before, which was building a great American single malt brand, I mean, one of the happiest moments, I, mean, I still feel the joy when I think about it was realizing that I just went from 50 states to six states that I need to, I'll use the term, defend, because it's not even attack. Uh, and you know, we went from 35 or so countries to one. And, and of course, you know, over time, we'll need to build that back up. But, but it is just incredibly difficult to, you know, to cover more geography than an independent company really should. Uh, so it's important to manage that footprint. So why don't we move on? I think we should talk about the financing options available. Um, and I think actually, Nick, it might be interesting to have you kind of lead off on this, just in terms of what options are available to an entrepreneur, more when they're at concept stage. Because I think you know, most of the panel here is, are either you know, entrepreneurs who are, are a little further in their business, um, or also somebody like myself, Nick, um, or Frank, who are investing more on the right side of this picture. Um, but I do think it's important to talk about sort of out the gate. How do you go about it out the gate? So, uh, so my experience both with launching my own brand and being involved with Pernod Ricard, uh, I probably have more experience on the two different ends of the spectrum, as I mentioned earlier, as opposed to in the middle. Um, first of all, Pernod Ricard, we, at least in the U.S., have decided not to fund pre-revenue concepts. We don't do new-to-world innovation, at least temporarily. And quite frankly, it's because, you know, we looked at the success rates and we looked at how challenging it is to do it in a corporate environment, in a corporate setting. Irrespective of how talented the people are, there are just obstacles that exist there um, that an entrepreneur doesn't necessarily face. Now, sure, we have many, of re many other resources entrepreneurs don't have, but we, so, yeah, we, we looked at it and just said this is not something we can do well within our own walls, and we'd rather, uh, rather kind of outsource that to the market and, and choose among concepts that had been validated, choose among the winners that are out there. So I think getting strategic investment up front is probably not something I can speak to, but I can say that Pernod Ricard is not currently doing that in the U.S., uh, when I launched my own brand, uh, it, it, was, it was all friends and family for me. I mean, I think that, to me, that's, that's the low-hanging fruit. It's, uh, you know, these are people that are 
uh, not going to be quite frankly as rigorous in looking at uh, you know doing an investment analysis and looking at why to invest in you. I think they're doing it because of the relationship and trust with you and, and taking a flyer, so to speak, on you. So I think that that is probably the the most common an easy way to raise capital, pending you've got a, a good network of friends with some money in their pockets. I think there are other, um, it mentions angel investors, so you know, increasingly I've seen angel investors looking at the space. Um, I don't know if how familiar the crowd is with angels, but angels are high net worth, you know, accredited investors that uh, more often than not do this as a profession. Uh, either full-time or, or part-time, and most cities by now have, you know, have their own angel network, so whether it's a, a city affiliation, a university, a industry group, whatever it is, you can pretty much find an angel group that could be somehow catered to your specific, uh, specific needs. I think another one I'll mention that's not up there is, is crowdfunding, which I can't say, I don't know if anybody on the panel has had much experience with, but seeing it from the other side, I have seen a lot of entrepreneurs coming to us that have uh, kind of creatively use crowdfunding to get to just get the ball rolling before they had any any revenue. So I think that's interesting. Um, and maybe one more is is doing you know kind of creative equity for services type of deals. So instead of spending a million dollars on creating a package and a liquid with some flavor specialists, you know, are there? I, I certainly know there are groups out there that will trade services for equity instead. So that could be a creative way. Um, you know, if you don't have access to those wealthy investors up front to get some services uh, in exchange for equity instead. I, I think the reality at the moment is, is that there is a lot of money around. You know, I, I don't see many good concepts not getting funded, and I see plenty of really bad concepts getting funded. So the reality is I think you're going to have choices, and every choice is going to involve some trade-offs. There is not a perfect solution out there. Uh, so uh, any choice is going to have trade-offs, and so you've just got to be really clear about what those trade-offs are, I think. Um, you know, we, we are obviously linked to a strategic. We do, uh, do pre-revenue investment. Um, you know, obviously, it, that, the trade-off there for an entrepreneur is, well, I'm sort of kind of throwing my lot in with one partner at a very, very early stage before I've tried this. But then there's some benefits to that. You know, it's a partner who, as long as the momentum is there, will fulfill all of your funding needs through to the kind of promised land. That gives you half your life back at least in terms of not really having to think where the funding's coming from. So, so uh, you know, every single one of these we could go through and talk about what some of the trade-offs are. I think the clear thing is never, ever kid yourself that there's a perfect solution. Be really honest about what are the advantages and what are the disadvantages. Yeah, I was just going to add, it's interesting on this chart too, I have debt and uh, the visual doesn't show up, but it actually looks like this dollar sign pummeling some poor guy. I will say, you know, most people think of debt out <laughs> That's right. Most people think that it's, it's nearly impossible to go out and raise debt, um, you know, early on. I do think we've seen people be really creative about that, and particularly on the whiskey side. In the U.S., we see people who are finding partners who are willing to sort of secure the debt with the whiskey inventory, you know, in a secure location. So there are creative options there that are out there regarding debt that a lot of times I think people aren't thinking of. I think, yeah, one yeah. thing I'd say, I mean, you know, there are some markets where, where it is really possible. Ireland, there's a lot of the banks in Ireland, uh, you know, very happy to, to, to lend to distilleries. Um, I, I'd say, you know, we said everything has pluses and minuses. I would say if you're in an aged spirits business, there's one form where I can't really see any pluses in it, and that's, uh, that's kind of selling your new make inventory and then with some deal that you can buy it back three years later at maturity with, with some kind of coupon. I've never seen that work out well for people. Um, at the point you're buying it back, you're buying it back at a price which is uh, not only using up a lot of your cash, but wiping, wiping out your profitability makes it very hard to kind of go and get the next round of funding unless you've got an investor who is big enough to kind of say, I'm interested enough in doing this. I'm going to help you unwind all of that and pay off all those people and buy the, buy the stock back. And, you know, I don't mind that there's no profitability for several years. So I'd say those kind of barrel investing type schemes is the one thing that I would say is pretty toxic and uh, I would say don't go near. Gotcha. And then one positive example of buying whiskey is Whistle Pig Rye, 10 year old. You know, before anybody was paying attention to rye whiskey, about eight or nine years ago, two guys thought, hey, you know what? We're going to raise money and buy up all the 10 year old rye whiskey in the world. And they did that successfully. And now that won best whiskey in the world last year. An awesome creative example, I'd say, too, just in terms of how one thinks about raising funds. So um, I, I should probably cover, I'll, I'll cover kind of the VCPE side. 
um, and give a little texture to maybe what some of the differences is across this group too. Um, we do not invest from our standpoint in, in pre-revenue companies. Um, I think we typically invest in companies that are getting close to around two million in revenue. Um, and two million in revenue to us is usually when somebody's figured out, you know, how what's working, what's not working, how to make their brand kind of function in, let's say, one, two, maybe even three markets, um, and really have some good signs that they've figured out a few pieces of the puzzle. Um, and we can come and actually provide some growth equity to them, take a minority position, and really help with counsel and advice. Um, I think some of the difference that we see out there, probably between ourselves and other groups, um, has to do with the fact of you know what happens on the tail end. Um, I think we're, we, from our standpoint, are really looking towards, you know, how can we help somebody be in the best position humanly possible in five to seven years because we're looking for a nice return for ourselves. Um, it's a little bit different in terms of, I think, some of what are venture groups that are out there. And yet, similarly, I think there's incredible resources that exist within some of these venture groups from a sales and marketing standpoint that, that people, you know, really want. Um, and kind of deleverage what would be potentially their risk if they look out to that horizon and say, maybe I, maybe I, I you know, this doesn't need to be the next uh, Casa Amigos transaction at the end, um, but instead I'd really like to know that the path is going to go this very positive way. So just at a high level, the, the other thing I just wanted to mention, I, I always joke that VC and PE I used to think of as different things. I think um, there are a lot of funds that are out there in the marketplace and a lot of people really interested in in investing in spirits. Um, and I think as a result, you've seen a lot of investment that happens very, very early stage, um, which is actually probably worth sharing. This slide actually shows transactions that have happened over the past three years. But a lot of these transactions are companies that are below 3,000 in cases. So um, you start looking at that, and maybe it's minority investment, it's not majority. But what it does say is that larger brands are, or larger companies are really looking at, gosh, you know, we want to be in these spaces. We're fascinated by founders. How can we invest a little bit earlier um, and provide some capital? So I think there is a lot of opportunity that actually exists there. Um, if, I, if I can just yeah, add something, just in. to put in the plug for, uh, for empathy, <laughs> uh, you know, investors are people too, right? So, uh, as I'm sure these gentlemen will agree. Um, the, I, I think it's really important, you know, looking at it from the standpoint of the entrepreneur, I mean, of course, we're focused on you know the money we need to you know realize our vision, if you will. Uh, the money itself is a commodity, but the reason somebody made the decision to invest you know varies very significantly depending on who it comes from. Uh, and I think it's really important you know for anybody going out to raise any amount of money, whether it's you know in the thousands or the millions or the tens of millions. Uh, Make sure you understand why that person is considering the investment, because that will that will dictate what relationship you have with that person over the coming years. Where, you know, a very early stage angel or you know even friends and family investor is almost certainly investing in you, and you know who knows what the business will really turn into. They like you. They believe in you. They want to invest in you, uh, and that person you know, we'll be very patient and we'll watch things unfold. And uh, ideally that person is investing a quantity of money that, you know, they can live without if it all goes horribly wrong. So they're not calling every week to find out how it's going. Uh, once you start moving more into, you know, funds, uh, I mean, there is a clear expectation of a return. And it's not that, you know, those people aren't nice. It's just they in turn went out and raised money to build the fund to make the investment. and. All of a sudden, it's not just about not losing your money. It's about how quickly it can turn into you know, a certain annual rate of return that they have guaranteed to their investors. Uh, and so you know, there's pressure everywhere. Uh, and then eventually, you know, an investment from, from a larger company, from a strategic, uh, you know, is, is obviously intended to you know, help that brand be successful and eventually be part of that company. But you've really got to know what the why behind somebody investing because most of the really bad relationships between people raising money and those who funded them come from not really understanding those expectations at the beginning. To follow up on that point, I just would like to share two things with the group. And they're going to sound so obvious, but I can't tell you how many times I've run into these issues. The second you take money from other people, 
it's not your company anymore. It's their company or our company. It's not Tom's brand by himself. And the second thing is, most people when they ask for money, they don't call you again or send you reports until they need money again. So it's very important once you take other people's money that you send reports. Say, tell them what's good, what's bad monthly. You don't have to write a thesis, just very simple bullet points because that's when people start getting scared when you're not communicating with them. So I think that's very important for everybody to keep in mind. I think that's a great point. Um, and then actually, Nick, just talking about strategic venture groups and whatnot, how did Pernos come to be and sort of how has that landscape somewhat evolved as far as venture teams that are out there today? Sure, so, um, so it came to be, so I, I actually joined Pernod Ricard about three years ago and headed in the US their M&A and strategy team. And one of the uh, internal strategy projects we were looking at was launching this group that came to be New Brand Ventures. And some of the rationale there, if you look at, at innovation um, in the US, but I think this is probably pretty similar statistics globally as a general rule. Um, if you look at, at, at growth in the US, something like 60 to 70% of that growth is coming from innovation. Now, within innovation, we'd break it down further to say line extensions, which a lot of people may not consider true innovation, but line extensions, and then what we'd call new to world innovation, which is completely new concepts, new products. So of that 60 to 70%, it's, uh, it's roughly an even breakdown between new to world innovations and line extensions driving growth. So for us, it was very simple. It was, we know innovation is a major factor in driving growth in the industry. So we have to be playing in this space. And yet also in the US, we were actually well below what kind of the industry average was. So it was a pretty, pretty important strategic priority for us to launch new brand ventures. And then there's a whole slew of other, you know, the, you know purely the strategic insights that we're, we're gathering from having this group the information sharing, I mean, we look at it in a, you know, in any of the entrepreneurs out there, I, I, I would love to have conversations with you because I always look at it as kind of this open innovation system, if you will, this flow of learning. Hopefully you can learn from big and big can learn from small. So I very much view it as that. Um, so that was our, our initial, initial rationale. I think if you look at our portfolio, we've had Jameson growing at double digits for 20 plus years. And to be completely frank, in the U.S., we don't really have identified our next major growth star. Now, whether New Brand Ventures can deliver another Jameson or maybe a slew of brands that uh, don't turn to be multi-million uh, case brands but can be very successful in their own right, we're still uh, uncertain where that road will go. But certainly, we're aiming for the stars with our group. So what was the second part of the question? Sorry. I don't know. I think that was a good enough answer. Okay. <laughs> Take it. But I do think uh, the next question was more what makes a company an interesting investment for, say, an angel, a PE, or a strategic? And it'd be interesting to hear kind of your perspectives on that. And also, John, for you too, as an angel, and maybe we should start there. What do you look for? Does the brand have a unique selling proposition? Is there a market need? What's the size of the addressable market you're trying to address? Um, then if I'm sold on the product, the quality, okay, who's controlling the supply? Are you dependent on a third party? Um, what about your raw materials cost? If I'm looking at a tequila, I'm concerned because agave prices have continued to soar, so maybe that's not such a, a good thing. Then, you know, if I, if, that, if I check all the boxes and I like the brand, then the next thing is equally important to me is who's the people or person behind this product, then I have a conversation with them, and then I find out in about three minutes whether they're full of bull or not, and I make my decision. If they're not gonna listen, take advice, whether they use it or not, it's a different issue. They don't have to take my advice, but the next thing I look at is, okay, what's your, what's your viewpoint on building a board? And then if the answer is, oh, no, 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 it's my company. I need to keep control, I run as quick as I can. I want people that are gonna be open to bringing in and building a board that have complementary skill sets. If you're not open to that and your vision is just, I want my mother-in-law, my father-in-law, and my wife on the board, it's a losing proposition. And I've seen too many companies fail because they wanna control everything. And I'll turn it over to 
I was just gonna say, and before we go on, that dynamic though of the family business, I do think the one decision you, ha you really have to make out the gate and be very clear on in your mind is, am I building a family business or am I building a brand that, that has my name on it that will live into perpetuity, but it's not necessarily going to be my son's business, my grandson's business, you know, et cetera. Because that, that's where I think the stuff, we've seen some relationships kind of break down where people are really disappointed at where they netted out. A lot of it has to do with the family business side. But sorry, go ahead, Frank. I just wanted to unpick that bit about team a little bit, because uh, that's, that's the first thing we look at, really. And you, you screen for a couple of things. Firstly, you're thinking about the core team, who's actually there doing it day in, day out. When you get those presentations with all those kinds of advisors, you know, people that they've met, had one meeting with, can I put your name in the deck? I mean, that, that is a massive, massive turnoff. It's like, who's, who's going to be in the business day in, day out? I think one of the things we screen for, the first thing is belief. You know, do we... Can they convince me? Can they make me believe? Because this job is all about doing that multiple times over. You know, whether that's hiring a team yourself, whether that's kind of getting distributors on board, getting getting your retail partners and consumers. So, can they answer why belief is really important? I think I think we when we're thinking about proposition, we we're really open to the fact that people are really disrupting the industry. I mean, if you look at the growth in Europe that's come in super premium gin and above, none of that came from the big companies. That's all entrepreneurs saying, I can deliver a better experience. So, But what we screen for is naivety. So we don't mind someone coming in sort of saying, look, I want to sell 50,000 cases at 45 pounds. We just screen for naivety about, do they realize kind of what a challenge that's going to be and therefore how they need to construct the company to be able to do that. So we're, we're fine with people saying, I'm going to pull off some magic. I just want them to be conscious of that and not be naive to think that they're going to do something really easy. And Nick, do you have anything to add to? I'll, I'll talk. I don't know if I'm going to add anything to what, the, what these gentlemen said, but I think, you know, we look at... I missed that one. What was it? <laughs> Tell the joke? Yeah. Just in 10 seconds. So in, in case you don't know, uh, Frank is actually my partner as of last month through an investment we received from Diageo. Well and we had a meeting last month that I hope you don't mind me sharing this part of it where we were talking about our volume projections and the feedback we got was you know a moment of silence followed by well that would be unprecedented growth <laughs> <laughs> but you know we're on board to help you accomplish it <laughs> so yeah i think to echo um some of the answers already we we, we definitely look at at uh you know market product management and fit so in addition to other things but that's a simple list there i think market you know we uh we tend to like large markets high growth markets uh, in an ideal case a large and high growth market um, or a real reason to believe why maybe a stagnant stagnant market or you know a market that hasn't been premiumized can be premium uh, can be premiumized or that there's some catalyst to to initiating the growth um, I think product, I won't touch on that too much. Um, you know, management team, I think is, is super important and we want to, and that fits into the, the, the last point about fit. We want to make sure there's a good culture fit and we'll, we'll slow down the deal if we have to, to make sure that, that we've got the right culture fit, that we've got a good understanding of what the management team's vision is, vision for growth, where they think they can add value, what they want from us, where they think they can, where they think we can add value. And of course, if our vision and our kind of checklist for those things is, is aligned to what they're saying. So we'll spend a lot of time on, on culture fit. And then of course, strategic fit as well. Does it fit into the port portfolio? You know, is it, is it cannibalistic or complementary to other products? Uh, are there synergies and, and cost savings we can help extract? Um, so, so I think it's, it's quite a few things, but I'd, I'd narrow it down to those, those four. So product, market, management, and fit. Um, and I just want to make sure we have enough time for, uh, for Q&A, so I'm probably going to go to the last one. You know, are there, any, are there any sort of clear recipes for success or common pitfalls or misconceptions with various financing options? What's our kind of top one that we've seen um, on either side that, that is top of mind for you all? And then I'd love to open it up for Q&A. I, I think um, shared intent. So, so are you, are you, are you really pretty highly convinced that both sides are aligned around 
the journey, what it's going to take, the fact that it's probably going to take three times as much, and what the outcome you're seeking is. Because I, the, 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 the worst thing is when you see a business which is kind of doing well and you get investors wanting to cash out at a point where the management want to keep going. And um, it just becomes a massive kind of distraction and really kind of painful for everyone involved. So, it, you know, it comes back to that thing about kind of trade-offs, but, but think of those trade-offs, but also think, am I really kind of convinced that the outcome that we're heading towards is what both sides want equally? Or what are the chances that our, uh, our goal is going to become misaligned at some point? And the greater that chance of misalignment, then the more cautious you should be about accepting it. The biggest turnoff for me in investing, high valuations. Everybody thinks their brand is worth $10 million and you haven't sold case one. And then you end up doing down rounds to get it adjusted. So please be, think about what you're asking people to invest at what valuation, because that's going to save a lot of time. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo that. I think valuation to me, there's, there's two components. I think a lot of a lot of entrepreneurs are a little bit guilty of, of anchoring on, you know, the Casamigos multiple and expecting that, that that's what they should get and that's what they will get. And I think the reality, just like success rates in the industry, I mean, the, the deals that get done in the, at those multiples are few and far between. And I think nobody likes to talk about the deals that aren't getting done or the deals that are getting done at much more fair valuations to both sides where value is created for both parties going forward. Um, so yeah, I think, I think valuation is important and, and I think people do get too stuck on the number sometimes instead of thinking about, don't think about you know, the, the slice of the pie you get now, think about how much bigger the pie you can create together will be and ultimately I think that can result in, in both parties, quite frankly, taking more money in their pocket. Um, the second thing I'll say in terms of, of pitfalls is I think financing is a bit like like distribution, that there's this, this misconception that, you know, once you have financing, you're golden. Like once you have distribution, you're golden. I think that's not the case at all because to me, any of those financing options put up mean nothing if you don't have a good consumer poll proposition. Um, so I would be super uh, concerned and focused. I'm sure there's a lot of other panels on that. We're not talking about that here, but I would be super focused on making sure that that USP, as John said, or that real emotional connection to the end consumer, you know, tech entrepreneurs call it product market fit, that that product market fit is there because that, again, doesn't mean anything raising money unless you've got that. Right. And then I just wanted to open it up for questions. If anybody had any questions. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to ask or follow up a little bit on the question, which we get a lot and sometimes we struggle a little bit answering it. And I know you guys tiptoed around a little bit. You mentioned a little bit the Casamigos valuation, which everybody assumes was pretty high. Uh, but nobody really wants to talk too much about what are really ranges that are more acceptable. So, you know, John, you said, like, oh, there's a $10 million valuation without having sold anything. Well, entrepreneurs sometimes come in and think about, like, yeah, I want to be a majority owner later and I might need $5 million. So, I gotta end up with $10 million valuation because otherwise I'm not gonna be a majority owner anymore. So there have to be some kind of ranges. So if you guys could each provide some ranges without saying, oh, look, this is exactly the number, but ranges and also what type of metrics because to a certain degree, some entrepreneurs say, like, yeah, I don't have an EBITDA, so therefore I can't have an EBITDA multiple. So I have a revenue multiple. And a lot of guys come in and say, yeah, you know what? I wanna have $2,000 a case or $1,000 a case. So just like, to provide some insights with regards to how you look at it, at what stage, and what the ranges are. Oh, great. Nick's going to take it first. Yours. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, so Harry, I'm not going to fall into this trap and anchor to a number, but I will give more, <laughs> more, um, more, more guidance. Um, look, I, I think it all depends, and it, and it really does all depend. It depends on how big the company is, what future growth prospects are, you know, what the, what the synergies are, uh, you know, with, with a strategic and, and with the entrepreneur. I will say, you know, as a general rule, if I were in your guys' shoes, which I was, it's not hard to look at what the large strategics that are public companies are trading at in terms of a revenue or an EBITDA multiple. Now, if I were in your shoes and I believed I had a high growth company that certainly would be growing larger than most of the strategics, there's probably a fair argument. Now, this assumes you've got all the other 
boxes checked, of course, you know, management, fantastic management team, fantastic product, good market, all that. I don't think it's unreasonable to think that valuation is, is all about, uh, well, it's all really about payback. And so what does that mean? It's about projecting future cash flows, which is dependent on what your growth expectations are, discounting them back or whatever. It's, it's about getting your money back, right? As simple as that is. So, you know, if you think that, that your brand has more um, uh, probability of growing faster than ours, I think that there's a, faster than a large strategic, I think there's a very good logic to say it should be higher than a 4x revenue multiple, which is roughly where the strategics are trading at. Um, I think to, to Harry's other question, which is much more interesting to me, um, you know, how do you, how, what metrics are you looking at and how do you take into consideration other factors? Uh, yeah, obviously it's very difficult to use an EBITDA multiple when you're an early stage company. EBITDA is kind of a, a metric for cash flow, uh, if you will, and I think many brands aren't EBITDA positive when they first come to us, so that doesn't make sense. But I, think, I also think it's too simple to just look at revenue and sales or volumes and say that that's the metric and you can get yourself into trouble there. Um, Frank, you know, talked earlier about companies, some of the brands they, they're working with laying down a lot of whiskey. If you're purely using a, a sales multiple metric, you can get yourself in a situation where the value of the inventory that the brand or management team has been laying down is in excess of what you would look at to value the company on a sales multiple. So that could play a role. I think vice versa, the opposite could happen where sales are good, but the owners haven't been laying down enough inventory and there's no way to fulfill the future growth prospects. So hard question to answer, but I typically, I like look, looking at income statements, so sales and EBITDA type of multiples. I also look at, like looking at balance sheets. So what's, you know, what are the assets? Is this a virtual brand and virtual distillery or is there an actual distillery there? Have they laid down liquid? Do they have equipment, et cetera? So I'll look at a more holistic view. I, I was just gonna add something to what Harry said though too. You know, one of the things, and John referenced this a little bit too, is if you go out the gate with a really big valuation and you don't have revenue yet, I'm just gonna, which most of us are not investing in a pre-revenue state, um, you know, you suddenly end up in a situation where all of a sudden your brand is now, let's say 2,000 cases, which by the way, 2,000 cases is really hard to accomplish. So, um, and you look around and you go, well, gosh, I need some more money. Um, you know, and then you have to figure out how to raise and you have a really, really high valuation and you have an, a set of investors who feel like, gosh, what do you mean the valuation isn't now this big, big number out here? So I do think there's an interesting dynamic where if you have no revenue, it feels like you could have almost any valuation because you're sort of, you know, thumb in the wind kind of a thing. Um, and yet similarly, I think you want to make sure when you actually do go out and raise that you raise enough such that you feel like, gosh, this feels like an appropriate number, and I know I'm going to need money down the line, and when I go talk to investors then, the number's going to feel right. Um, and then the last thing I was just going to mention, you know, we tend to way over-focus on valuation, particularly, you know, at the stage that, that uh, my company is getting involved in, in businesses. What we don't talk enough about is what's your percentage ownership going to be? And there are actually different things you can do to look at somebody's percentage of ownership and try and work to those types of numbers without getting so overly hung up um, on, you know, well, I feel like I feel like the number should be 20 million, um, and it's like maybe it's not 20 million. Maybe it's other things that you really care about that we need to make sure are part of, you know, what this looks like. So yeah, I'm I mean, sorry, I think I think that's our approach. We we start from the perspective of we want to sit between 20 and 30 percent because we want it to be very clear that the team is still in control of the company. Um, and then we view it as this is the start of the relationship, not the end of the relationship. So let's try and do something which feels fair to all sides. I don't think it was the hardest bit of the conversation in our, in our conversation, was it? So it was, it, it, but I think if you are, if you're, if, you're, if you're raising, I think the thing you've got to think about is just about um, wh what, what's the next raise going to be and what's the mechanism for that. I think the danger is you lock yourself into some kind of precedent which could work against you in, in future. Um, you know, we have a structure that kind of gets around that, that after that initial conversation, we do no, no other valuation until the exit. Um, uh, so it just takes it off the table because it's a waste of everyone's time just to be fighting over it. The only thing I have to add to the panel's discussion is, does the brand own the trademark? Do they own the trademark just in the US? Do they own it in Europe, Asia? Because that has a huge bearing, in my mind, on the valuation of the future sale of the company. Thank you. Thank you to everybody on the panel. For